Welcome back. I'm Logan, your host for the Daily Bible Reading Podcast, where we are journeying through the Bible chronologically, taking it one day at a time. Today is day 222, and we are looking at Jeremiah chapter 10 through 13 today. Here, Jeremiah describes the foolishness of the people's idolatry and explains that it is a breaking of the covenant relationship that he established with them. They have spoiled the relationship. But before we get into that, let's pray and ask that God would guide our reading. Oh, and I hope you know that while I'm praying, you are completely free to pray your own prayer for this time. In fact, I would encourage it. I enjoy these pre-written prayers because they help me to think of things that I wouldn't have considered on my own. But if you want to pray the IOUS prayer or your own words, then mute me for a minute and go right ahead. Today's prayer comes from the book The Valley of Vision, collected by Arthur Bennett. It's entitled Shortcomings. O living God, I bless thee that I see the worst of my heart as well as the best of it, that I can sorrow for those sins that carry me from thee, that it is thy deep and dear mercy to threaten punishment so that I may return, pray, and live. My sin is to look on my faults and be discouraged, or to look on my good and be puffed up. I fall short of thy glory every day by spending hours unprofitably, by thinking that the things I do are good when they are not done to thy end, nor spring from the rules of thy word. My sin is to fear what never will be. I forget to submit to thy will and fail to be quiet there. But scripture teaches me that thy active will reveals a steadfast purpose on my behalf, and this quietens my soul and makes me love thee. Keep me always in the understanding that saints mourn more for sin than other men, for when they see how great is thy wrath against sin, and how Christ's death alone pacifies that wrath, that makes them mourn the more. Help me to see that although I am in the wilderness, it is not all briars and barrenness. I have bread from heaven, streams from the rock, light by day, fire by night, thy dwelling place, and thy mercy seat. I am sometimes discouraged by the way, and though winding and trying, it is safe and short. Death dismays me, but my great high priest stands in its waters, and will open me a passage, and beyond is a better country. While I live, let my life be exemplary. When I die, may my end be peace. We want to pray as well for the around 26,000 Kianga peoples of Nigeria. The Kianga have four distinct subgroups that are each identified by their different self-inflicted facial scars. Many of them are bilingual. They speak their own language, Kianga, along with the dominant Hausa language. Over the last 70 years, Islam has become the main religious affiliation of the Kianga people, though animism lies beneath the surface of their form of Islam. Animism, if you don't know, is the belief that everyday inanimate objects, places, animals, things like that, contain a distinct spiritual essence or form. Northwestern Nigeria is heavily populated by Islamic militias, so reaching the Kianga people can be difficult because of heavy resistance by Muslims who falsely believe that embracing Christ means rejecting their own people. Because of the prevalent Muslim environment, medical care centers could be a good way to build bridges of love. Followers of Christ with medical skills can offer their services to Kianga people. We pray that the few believers among the Kianga would be spiritually comforted in a dark and lonely world. We pray that their spirits would be lit afire for the gospel and that they would be willing to lose their lives for the sake of Christ. We pray that the Lord would send workers into the harvest field to help build his church and begin a church planting movement among the Kianga people. We pray that the Lord would convict the souls of the Kianga leaders so that they embrace the Savior and encourage others to do the same. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
All right, we have four chapters ahead of us today, and we will begin with a look at the stupidity of idolatry. But don't be too quick to laugh. We are just as prone to it as they were. I'm ready to read if you are. Let's go. Jeremiah chapter 10. Hear the word that the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, Learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them, for the customs of the peoples are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so that it cannot move. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field, and they cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither is it in them to do good. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due, for among all the wise ones of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. They are both stupid and foolish. The instruction of idols is but wood. Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish, and gold from Uphaz. They are the work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the goldsmith. Their clothing is violet and purple. They are all the work of skilled men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath the earth quakes, and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Thus shall you say to them, The gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens, and he makes the mist rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain, and he brings forth the wind from his storehouses. Every man is stupid and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols, for his images are false, and there is no breath in them. They are worthless, a work of delusion. At the time of their punishment, they shall perish." Not like these is he who is the portion of Jacob, for he is the one who formed all things, and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Gather up your bundle from the ground, O you who dwell under siege. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I am slinging out the inhabitants of the land at this time, and I will bring distress on them that they may feel it. Woe is me because of my hurt, my wound is grievous. But I said, Truly this is an affliction, and I must bear it. My tent is destroyed, and all my cords are broken. My children have gone from me, and they are not. There is no one to spread my tent again, and to set up my curtains. For the shepherds are stupid, and do not inquire of the Lord. Therefore they have not prospered, and all their flock is scattered. A voice a rumor, behold it comes, a great commotion out of the north country, to make the cities of Judah a desolation, a lair of jackals. I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Correct me, O Lord, but in justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. Pour out your wrath on the nations that know you not, and on the peoples that call not on your name. For they have devoured Jacob, they have devoured him and consumed him, and have laid waste his habitation. Chapter 11 The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Hear the words of this covenant, and speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Cursed be the man who does not hear the words of this covenant that I commanded your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Listen to my voice and do all that I command you. So shall you be my people, and I will be your God, that I may confirm the oath that I swore to your fathers, to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as at this day. Then I answered, So be it, Lord. And the Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah, 
and in the streets of Jerusalem. Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers when I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, warning them persistently, even to this day, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but every one walked in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore I brought upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did not. Again the Lord said to me, A conspiracy exists among the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, who refused to hear my words. They have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant that I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am bringing disaster upon them, that they cannot escape. Though they cry to me, I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the gods to whom they make offerings, but they cannot save them in their time of trouble. For your gods have become as many as your cities, O Judah, and as many as the streets of Jerusalem are the altars you have set up to shame, altars to make offerings to Baal. Therefore, do not pray for this people, or lift up a cry or prayer on their behalf. For I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their trouble. What right has my beloved in my house when she has done many vile deeds? Can even sacrificial flesh avert your doom? Can you then exult? The Lord once called you a green olive tree, beautiful with good fruit. But with the roar of a great tempest, he will set fire to it, and its branches will be consumed. The Lord of hosts who planted you has decreed disaster against you because of the evil that the house of Israel and the house of Judah have done, provoking me to anger by making offerings to Baal. The Lord made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not know it was against me they devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. But, O Lord of hosts, who judges righteously, who tests the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the men of Anathoth, who seek your life, and say, Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, or you will die by our hand. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword, their sons and their daughters shall die by famine, and none of them shall be left, for I will bring disaster upon the men of Anathoth, the year of their punishment. Chapter 12 Righteous are you, O Lord, when I complain to you, yet I would plead my case before you. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? You plant them, and they take root, they grow and produce fruit. You are near in their mouth, and far from their heart. But you, O Lord, know me. You see me and test my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter, and set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the land mourn, and the grass of every field wither? For the evil of those who dwell in it, the beasts and the birds are swept away, because they said, he will not see our latter end. If you have raced with men on foot, and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? And if in a safe land you are so trusting, what will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? For even your brothers and the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. They are in full cry after you. Do not believe them, though they speak friendly words to you. I have forsaken my house, I have abandoned my heritage, I have given the beloved of my soul into the hands of her enemies. My heritage has become to me like a lion in the forest. She has lifted up her voice against me, therefore I hate her. Is my heritage to me like a hyena's lair? Are the birds of prey against her all around? Go, assemble all the wild beasts, bring them to devour. Many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. They have trampled down my portion. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it a desolation. Desolate it mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate, but no man lays it to heart. Upon all the bare heights in the desert, destroyers have come. 
for the sword of the Lord devours from one end of the land to the other. No flesh has peace. They have sown wheat and have reaped thorns. They have tired themselves out, but profit nothing. They shall be ashamed of their harvests because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Thus says the Lord concerning all my evil neighbors who touch the heritage that I have given my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I will pluck them up from their land, and I will pluck up the house of Judah from among them. And after I have plucked them up, I will again have compassion on them. And I will bring them again, each to his heritage and each to his land. And it shall come to pass, if they will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives, even as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be built up in the midst of my people. But if any nation will not listen, then I will utterly pluck it up and destroy it, declares the Lord. Chapter 13 Thus says the Lord to me, Go, and buy a linen loincloth, and put it around your waist, and do not dip it in water. So I bought a loincloth according to the word of the Lord, and put it around my waist, and the word of the Lord came to me a second time. Take the loincloth that you have bought, which is around your waist, and arise. Go to the Euphrates, and hide it there, in a cleft of the rock. So I went, and hid it by the Euphrates, as the Lord commanded me. And after many days the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take from there the loincloth that I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates, and dug, and I took the loincloth from the place where I had hidden it. And behold, the loincloth was spoiled. It was good for nothing. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, Even so will I spoil the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who stubbornly follow their own heart and have gone after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be like this loincloth, which is good for nothing. For as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory. But they would not listen. You shall speak to them this word, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Every jar shall be filled with wine. And they will say to you, Do we not indeed know that every jar will be filled with wine? Then you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will fill with drunkenness all the inhabitants of this land, the kings who sit on David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will dash them one against another, fathers and sons together, declares the Lord. I will not pity or spare or have compassion, that I should not destroy them. Hear and give ear, be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God, before he brings darkness, before your feet stumble on the twilight mountains. And while you look for light, he turns it into gloom, and makes it deep darkness. But if you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears, because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. Say to the king and the queen mother, Take a lowly seat, for your beautiful crown has come down from your head. The cities of the Negev are shut up, with none to open them. All Judah is taken into exile, wholly taken into exile. Lift up your eyes and see, those who come from the north, where is the flock that was given you, your beautiful flock? What will you say when they set as a head over you, those whom you yourself have taught to be friends to you? Will not pangs take hold of you, like those of a woman in labor? And if you say in your heart, Why have these things come upon me? It is for the greatness of your iniquity that your skirts are lifted up and you suffer violence. Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? Then also you can do good, who are accustomed to do evil. I will scatter you like chaff, driven by the wind from the desert. This is your lot, the portion I have measured out for you, declares the Lord, because you have forgotten me and trusted in lies. I myself will lift up your skirts over your face, and your shame will be seen. I have seen your abominations, your adulteries and neighings, your lewd whorings on the hills in the field. Woe to you, O Jerusalem! How long will it be before you are made clean?
you're looking for encouragement for life's journey, a better understanding of the Bible, or an honest look at Scripture, check out the Christ Center Journey. I'm your host, Dan Shipton, and I'd like to invite you to check us out. Mondays through Fridays, we air new programs. It's a daily podcast that's built around building one another up as Christ followers in this journey we call life. So why don't you join us by looking us up on your podcasting host for the Christ-Centered Journey. No sin is condemned more severely in the Old Testament than the sin of idolatry. And no prophet denounced this sin more frequently or scathingly than did Jeremiah and Isaiah. It was a recurring attraction for the Israelites from their earliest history, even though it is specifically forbidden by Mosaic law. With the coming exile, the temptation would only increase while the people found themselves in exile in these pagan surroundings. Chapter 10 is a stinging rebuke of the foolishness of idol worship mixed in with words of praise for the incomparable nature of God. Jeremiah here is appealing to the people not to be influenced by the religious beliefs and practices of their neighbors, much of which included awe and worship and fear of the sun, moon, and stars. He describes such customs as worthless, that is, empty or ephemeral, like a vapor. This is the same word that Solomon uses to describe everything under the sun in Ecclesiastes. The Hebrew word is hebel. God created the heavenly bodies, and therefore he is in control of them. They're not to be worshipped or feared. To do such is worthless. The biblical prohibition against idols raises a question. Why does God forbid the making of an image? I mean, couldn't a beautifully carved representation of God or a magnificent cathedral inspire or be valuable to aid in worship without being worshipped itself? Well, certainly it could, but it would be impossible even for a Michelangelo to make a representation of God that would even come close to doing justice to the sum of his attributes. An image would tend to restrict our concept of God because we would associate our thoughts about him with his visual representation. A greater danger is that the image could become the object of worship instead of the God it represents. And finally, there's the idea that we will become like the object of our worship, and a cold, lifeless idol produces a cold, lifeless faith. We are shocked at how gullible these people are who would worship such gods. I mean, how could people worship a piece of wood that they had carved from a tree, decorated with gold and silver overlay, and then fastened securely with a hammer and nails so that it wouldn't fall apart or topple over? Jeremiah mocked these man-made gods by comparing them to a scarecrow out in a melon patch. They are unable to speak, move, or walk. They are helpless to do either harm or good. Therefore, there's no reason to fear them. But if we define a god as anything more important to us than the living god, then are not the gods that we sometimes worship just as foolish? The gods of possessions, power, pleasure and a thousand other passing things that take priority over our relationship with the Lord? The command not to learn the ways of the nations, then, is very similar to Paul's command not to conform to the pattern of this world, from Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The child of God should not be awed by worldly affluence or enticed by worldly pleasures, because they are temporary and worthless. They are hebel. Verses 6 through 10 stand in striking contrast to Jeremiah's ridicule of these worthless idols. They describe the uniqueness, the power, and the greatness of God. He deserves to be worshipped as king of all the nations. The people are justifiably called senseless and foolish because they are being taught by worthless wooden idols. They look to these idols for instruction, but a piece of wood can't instruct. Even though they were artistically carved and beautifully decorated, the idols were still only pieces of wood. Dressing them up doesn't transform them into living gods. Though the gods of this world are often beautiful on the outside, they are hebel, worthless on the inside. The contrast is clear. 
God is true. The idols are false. He is living. They are lifeless. He is eternal. They are subject to decay and destruction. He is powerful in his wrath, and they are powerless before him. Now we may ask, why would people want to worship something so foolish and helpless as an idol? But if we think about it simply, human nature is such that we want to believe in something, even if it's not truly worthy of our faith. Also, people prefer to see what they are worshiping. It's much more difficult to worship God in spirit and in truth as he commands the woman at the well. Above everything, a God made by human hands can be controlled to do one's own bidding. This clearly happens still today. How often do you hear people say something like, well, my God would never send anyone to hell? Well, that's a true statement because, quote unquote, my God is a figment of your own imagination and it doesn't have the power to do anything good or bad. It's simply an idol. On the other hand, the God of the Bible is sovereign and he cannot be controlled by sacrifices, incantations, or threats. Idols don't make any real demands upon their worshipers. But God insists, be holy because I am holy. Now we might not have decorated wooden statues as idols today, but idol worship is still alive and well. As we enter into chapter 11 and following, we see a transition to the reason why this idol worship is such an offense to God. Besides the fact that these aren't gods at all, it's because the people had entered a covenant with God to worship him alone. That is the first command of the covenant agreement on Mount Sinai, also known as the Ten Commandments. God has held up his end of the deal. He's faithful. They are in the land that he has promised. But the people are covenant breakers. And because of this, an inescapable judgment is coming upon them. And again, Jeremiah is forbidden from even praying for this people, for his countrymen, his brothers. He, like Noah, is declaring a coming judgment and is being ignored. These people thought that they could worship other gods and blend in with the nations around them. Well, now God is leaving them to the care of these other so-called gods. And the people are about to find out that they are impotent. Here in chapters 11 and 12, we get a glimpse into the thoughts of Jeremiah as he carries out the Lord's decrees. They reveal his struggles and tension. These are like confessions or complaints because they are protests against evil or plots directed against him. And instead of lashing out on Twitter or something like that, he goes to God with his confession and we see God answer him. These confessions reveal that Jeremiah was a real human being. He was subject to the same kind of emotional highs and lows that we are as ordinary people. They remind us that even the most dedicated person may at times find it difficult to do God's will. They also show us that God uses imperfect people to do his work. He doesn't wait until we become perfected saints to use us. Finally, they remind us that we shouldn't be reluctant to admit our weaknesses and our fears and our doubts to him. The first one, beginning in chapter 11, verse 18, finds Jeremiah confessing that he feels like a lamb being led to the slaughter. And God assures him that those that conspire to persecute him will be punished. Then, the second one in chapter 12, verse 1, laments the prosperity of wicked men. Now, this is a question that the Bible asks many times. We see it asked by Job, Habakkuk, Malachi, in the Psalms, and other places. Jeremiah first here affirms God's righteousness. The prosperity of wicked men is not a question of God's integrity. God is just and righteous. However, Jeremiah can't reconcile God's justice in his mind with the fact that these wicked people, like those plotting against him, appear to prosper and live at ease. He seems to say, you're right, God, but I still want to argue with you. And notice that God doesn't reprimand this question. If we come to God recognizing that he is in charge, but acknowledging our inability to comprehend his ways, this is a good thing. He will give us wisdom and the ability to trust him more, though he may never give us the answer that we are looking for. He will tell us that he is enough. 
In this case, God didn't respond by coddling Jeremiah, nor did he provide a direct answer. He's not required to. God instead responded by telling Jeremiah that this was just practice. He warned Jeremiah that if he couldn't cope with these relatively minor difficulties that he was experiencing, then he should consider what he would do in a really serious situation. To put it in simple terms that we might use, he said, Cheer up, Jeremiah. The worst is yet to come. The Lord uses two analogies to make his point. He says, if in a foot race with men you get tired, then how are you going to compete in a race with horses? Or if you stumble in a safe country, how could you manage the jungle-like thickets that grew along the Jordan River? This is a well-advised warning to count the cost of serving God. We're never promised an easy life. In fact, we are warned of much worse We are commanded to take up our cross and follow Jesus. It also suggests that a person who cannot solve his own problems can't be very helpful to others in their time of trouble. These words may seem harsh, but muscle and strength are not built through the easy times, but through struggle. In chapter 13, Jeremiah is commanded to perform a symbolic act of buying a linen belt, and then after traveling to a river and hiding it among the rocks, going back to retrieve it, only to find that it was rotten. This was symbolic of the people themselves. They were supposed to be like a belt fastened to God, his people. But instead, they have attached themselves to Baal and their idols. Therefore, God will hide them away in Babylon, and this generation will show themselves to be useless much like the generation that wandered in the wilderness. He then references a familiar proverb that every wineskin or wine jar will be filled with wine. And knowing their hearts, God expects the people to act very presumptuously and assume that the good times will continue to come. This is what their false teachers are telling them, after all. But instead, Jeremiah is commanded to turn their presumption around and declare that instead of the blessing of wine... The cup of God's wrath will be poured out on them. They are drunken in their idolatry and their sin, and he will smash them to pieces like the wine jars, without remorse or compassion. Jeremiah tells them exactly why these things are coming upon them, and he doesn't hold out any hope for them to repent and change, because God has declared that they will not. He quotes a familiar proverb, and he asks whether a leopard can change his spots or an Ethiopian the color of his skin. The answer is no. But the final question of chapter 13 does offer some hope. It says, Woe to you, Jerusalem! How long will it be before you are made clean? They are unable to clean themselves up, and they stand facing imminent judgment. But there is a hope that they might be cleansed. It makes me think of the words of the hymn by Elvina Hall called Jesus Paid It All. It says, Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Tomorrow, we will see Jeremiah's disobedience. He's been told not to pray for these people on numerous occasions, but he does it anyway. I hope you'll join me then. Thank you for joining me today. I hope this has been encouraging to you. If so, please let me know by visiting the links that you find under the Connect With Us section in the show notes. I'm a simple man and I could use the encouragement. If you've been blessed enough that you would like to support the podcast, I would greatly appreciate that as well. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash DBR podcast to make either a one-time gift or to sign up for a monthly recurring membership gift. Until tomorrow, keep reading and keep worshiping.